Hi. Uh, I'm going to speak on the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Uh, as you know, there's a fairly widespread diaspora of Rohingyas around the world. Amongst frontline states, that is bordering states, um, Thailand and Malaysia, I understand, have substantial Rohingya populations. At some distance, you have Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, and so on. But Bangladesh uh, uh, is, in some ways, the closest frontline state and has interacted and been influenced by what has happened in the Arakan. Now, it is, I, I don't want to elaborate on the conditions of the Rohingyas in the Arakan because that is what has been discussed so far and uh, that, uh, that ground has been well covered. Uh, the repeated exodus of Rohingyas to Bangladesh, as far as I know, began in 1978 with King, Operation King Dragon. And then 1992, there was another major wave. 2012, there was another round of uh, 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 Rohingya expulsions, which led to, uh, for the first time, refusal by the Bangladesh state to even allow them to land or even if they were allowed to land, the boats were sent back. Uh, and this le also led to other uh, outcomes in terms of subsequent attacks on Buddhist temples in the region of Cox's Bazar, in Ramu and Ukhya, and so on. I will not go into those details. Uh, my, my focus will be on what has happened to the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. Uh, the point here is that it's estimated that about 30,000 live in the two official camps and a similar number in the two unofficial camps. But that is a very small fraction of the Rohingyas who are actually in Bangladesh. The, there are, there, I don't know about the results of the latest UN registration, but uh, estimates before that by scholars has ranged from 200,000 to 400,000. Uh, it could even be 500,000 according to some estimates. So the, the bulk of the Rohingyas don't live in camps, which, among which the official camps receive attention from the UNHCR and the international agencies. Apart from the spatial location, the other point to remember is that the Bangladesh government, which was initially sympathetic to Rohingya refugees coming in, uh, eventually decided it could not or would not uh, give the same kind of reception to the Rohingyas. I will come, uh, in, I'll go into some more details on this a bit later. Uh, as a result of that, from 1992, there has not been any official recognition of the people who've come from the Arakan, <coughs> the Rohingyas who come from the Arakan, as refugees. So they do not have refugee status. Now, what that means is that. On the one hand, uh, they are treated as illegal or irregular immigrants and have absolutely no rights to work and so on. But insofar as they are not recognized refugees, they're also not eligible for the kind of attention that the people in the camps get. So it is a kind of limiting situation where you have hundreds of thousands of people who have absolutely no rights. They do not have the right to be there. They do not have the right to exist. They do not have the right to take up employment. And if they are caught by security forces, they, fear they can face arrest, would be the least of it. It could extend up to uh, extortion uh, of whatever money they have, and indeed deportation uh, by the security forces. So that is the condition in which um, the Rohingya refugees have gradually uh, come into. Uh, now, one could argue that even so, people continue to keep escaping from Darakan to Bangladesh, and I think it's just a relative difference. Life is by no means certain or free of danger, even for the refugees who've arrived in Bangladesh. Now, how has this group survived? This is what I would like to go into, and then the consequences of this. 
Uh, one, the, I think the, the, the striking thing about the Rohingya refugees is that they have followed a set of strategies which uh, only people in limiting conditions can perhaps try and follow to exist and to survive. The first of this has been, uh, well, to begin with, they've had to violate the restrictions imposed on them. So the laws or the restrictions say that they're not recognized, they're not supposed to exist, they're not supposed to work. Well, they have existed, they've worked, and obviously they've had to undertake work under illegal conditions. Now, why has that been made possible? It has been made possible for uh, several reasons. One is that the Rohingyas have gone out of their way to offer, to make their labor and services attractive. So they've taken lower wages, they've worked under much more hazardous conditions, they've gone into areas where local Bengalis would not like to, like to, to would, would not want to go. So deep sea fishing, logging in deep forests, working for very small wages, all of those factors have had, have made them attractive to the employers. It was obviously kind of exploitative relationship. It's, it's by no means a fair relationship, but this has been one of the strategies of survival. Secondly, uh, in order to have some degree of protection, they, they've entered into clientelist relationships with local level power holders. This could be the landowner of the houses in which they stay, the employer who gives them a job, the money lenders who fund them, the big fish merchants who send them on boats to the Bay of Bengal, the timber merchants who will finance them for 15 day, one month trip into Bandarban uh, and give them some advances so that their families can stay. But not just providing them with patronage, when the police cracks down on Rohingya workers in, in Cox's Bazaar town, it's their employers who come and take them out. They pay the police, they bribe the police. Uh, the fish merchants, for example, uh, uh, came in and uh, paid, the, paid the police to uh, get the uh, Rohingya fishermen out of, the, out of the jail. So patronage structures, entering uh, those as clients, has been a second uh, strategy. Thirdly, the uh, they've sought registration in the electoral rolls, which means uh, getting voter ID cards and uh, some kind of national ID papers eventually. Now, it begins with electoral rolls, but if that can be established, then these are stepping stones to eventually getting passports and, and citizenship. So that has been a third strategy used by uh, the Rohingyas. And in a more general social and political sense, there has been a certain degree of organization. So there is, for example, chain migration and community formation in the sense that earlier refugees have helped the new arrivals and uh, there has been a sense of collaboration within the community supporting each other. So what we have is a whole range of economic, political and social strategies for survival and for consolidation. However, <clears throat> well, before, before that, what, is, what this has meant is the bulk of the refugees in Bangladesh, because they don't live in camps, but they are integrated to the host society in economic, social, political terms, no longer are seen as refugees. That has changed, but I, I start with the situation where the ch factors of change had not come in. And in that sense, they had become, so to speak, invisible refugees. This is a term that was used by Chris Lewa, who's been doing a lot of <coughs> serious research on the state of the Rohingyas in Bangladesh. Now, as I said, the such achievements of the Rohingya refugees have been precarious, and it has made them vulnerable to hostile reactions of those interests which have found their presence disadvantageous or uh, counterproductive for their own interests. For example, sections of the local labor force have resented being undercut by the refugees in the labor and product service markets. Uh, there have been movements to stop them wor working in certain quarters. For example, there was a movement to stop Rohingyas pulling rickshaws, which is a very popular 
way of survival. If you have nothing else, you can go to a rickshaw owner, hire the rickshaw for the day, pay rent to that owner, and keep the balance after you've paid the rent and so on. So this is something that has helped assetless, destitute people to survive. Well, one kind of challenge has come there. Another has been for them to work in more regular institutional structures like garments factories and so on, resistance and opposition to not to allow Rohingyas to work. Secondly, uh, there have been other kinds of more insidious restrictions. Children who normally can go to school, uh, government school in their own localities, uh, uh, and initially Rohingya children were able to go to school. Uh, at, at, at one point, restrictions were introduced, for, particularly for government schools, uh, so that no child would be accepted without some kind of an ID, some kind of a, uh, 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 evidence to show that they are not Rohingyas, but that they are local. This obviously uh, put many children out, either out of school or pushed them out to inferior schools run by madrasas and uh, other kind of uh, institutions which are not necessarily offering the best of education. Thirdly, there were systematic checks on the ID that the Rohingyas had got. In 2007 and 8, when there was a caretaker military government, uh, this led to <coughs> more than 100,000 Rohingyas who had acquired voter IDs having their IDs cancelled, and with the obvious implication that it, this would make gaining of citizenship much more difficult. But it was not just that. The fact that people could potentially get voter IDs meant that they were of some value to local politicians. They were a kind of board bank that politicians could use. Uh, as this uh, ID status was taken away, they also ceased to be useful as vote banks and therefore more expendable and uh, getting lesser attention for the, from the power structure. Uh, and then, of course, you had anti-immigrant campaigns, which began with small groups in Ukia uh, and other towns of, of, of that area. Um, there were these um, organizations with signboards outside their things calling for getting rid of the Rohingyas, getting rid of uh, these Burma Burmayas, is, as the word is pejoratively used. And this was supported by some of the local press, so the, Chita uh, the Cox's Bazaar Press, uh, Bangla Press, only, Bengali Press, uh, had, had some sections calling for the, yeah, calling for the uh, uh, expulsion of the Rohingyas at that point. So what has happened in, in Bangladesh is that things after the Rohingyas had in some sense entered into relationships which gave them a stake in living there and also a certain degree of certainty that they could perhaps acquire some degree of security and civil and political rights began to be uh, turned around by the several ways that I've just mentioned. It is that is the background of the boat people crisis that we see that we saw last year. That things were becoming increasingly difficult for Rohingya refugees. They were not giving, being given access to facilities which they had had before. One other factor which went to this was one of the leading political parties of the country decided that Rohingyas did not vote for them. That was their view uh, that they voted for their opponents. So that the cadres and leaders of that particular party are known to have handed over Rohingyas to the police for deportation. Uh, now this is a, at one level. The rank and file of that particular party I read last week was also involved in uh, extorting rent from them by giving them land. So it was not necessarily one way. I mean, it was a Janus faced relationship. There was patronage on one side but also if there wasn't sufficient extortion money coming through, they would, uh, they would be uh, penalized and, and, and put under the uh, auspices of the police. So this is what uh, led to the boat 
people crisis, people moving into Southeast Asian countries, even as far away as Australia. And it is at that point that the international media began to see the Rohingya refugees. That's when they began to become visible from having been invisible until then. And what is very striking is that it, it did not happen in the way that the liberal imagination, the liberal imagination expects attention to be given to a uh, disenfranchised and exploited group. On the contrary, it happened only after that that visibility came only after, under the limiting conditions of starvation, abduction, trafficking, extortion, and frequently death. So those were, those were the conditions which were required for the international media to wake up and see things.